And both of us, or were you directing that? Both of you. Why not? Okay. Why not? Yeah. Let's go for the whole thing. Yeah, you're in you're an equal opportunity uh, insulter this morning. Appreciate that. Um, uh, well, good. Well, uh, uh, again, let me apologize for the technical difficulties here at the beginning. Um, but uh, let me welcome everybody to our fourth Saturday seminar, uh, Saturday webinar of the year, which I'll remind you again is part of the series of Saturday webinars made possible by the Ashbrook Center, which is an independent center at Ashton University and offers a number of resources to help teachers teach young citizens what it means to be American. Uh, some of you have done this before, so you know who I am, but for those of you who haven't, I'll say something about uh, about the purpose of these uh, of these webinars and especially the one today. Uh, my name is Chris Burkett. I'm Associate Professor of Political Science and History here at Aspen University. I'm also co-chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program here at Ashland University. I teach graduate and undergraduate courses on American political thought, uh, including courses on the American founding, the progressive era. And I'm happy to say that this spring, uh, this coming spring, uh, as part of the uh, MAG program, I'll be teaching one of my favorite classes, which is on the American Western. So I'll be reading some good books and watching a few good films. But before I introduce our other panelists for today, uh, let me say something again about the theme, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, say something about the theme of, of these Saturday webinars and, uh, and, and what they've been sort of organized around uh, this year, which is our 50 core American documents list, which is available at 50docs.org or through teachingamericanhistory.org. But, uh, but the, the list of 50 core American documents uh, put together to reveal something to those who read those documents about how Americans have thought about the meaning of liberty and what self-government means over the course of our history. Uh, our, our purpose in coming up with this list was to renew and perpetuate conversations among students, teachers, and citizens on these important ideas. And so as I mentioned, our Saturday webinars this year are built upon these 54 American documents. And the idea behind these webinars is for scholars to have uh, uh, some thoughtful conversations on American principles and ideas and allow others to share in that conversation. So to that extent, we invite all of you who are joining us today to share in that conversation by typing in questions or thoughts uh, through the chat box feature of the software. And uh, uh, I'll try to get uh, our panelists to address as many of those questions as possible today. So feel free to submit questions at any time, and, and uh, we'll try to get to them as many, uh, get to as many of them as possible today. Let me also mention here at the beginning that at the end of the webinar today, participants will be asked, asked to fill out a survey form. And when you do that, please include your address so we can send you a letter documenting your participation today. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our panelists today. Peter Schramm is joining us again today. Happy to have him back. He's the Hello, senior Mark. fellow and director of the Ashford Scholar Program at the Ashford Center and professor of political science at Ashford University. He's edited, co-edited, and contributed to a number of books. Most recently, I think this is the most recent one, Peter. Your chapter on Coolidge and why Coolidge matters is outstanding. Um, you also wrote the introduction to Lord Charnwood's Abraham Lincoln a Biography. You earned your PhD uh, uh, in government from the Claremont Graduate School in 1980. Peter also holds two Master of Arts degrees, one from Claremont in government and the other in international history from the London School of Economics and Political Science, University of London. Happy to have you back, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Jeffrey Sikinga is also joining us today. He's Associate Professor of Political Science at Ashland University, Adjunct Fellow of the Ashbrook Center, and Senior Fellow in the Program on Constitutionalism and Democracy at the University of Virginia. He teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in political thought and constitutional law, and uh, a favorite undergraduate course, a favorite among undergrads here, Jeff, is your course on love and politics. <laughs> Who would ever have thought those two things would, would be mentioned in the same uh, sentence? But, um, a great course. Here are lots of great things about some other books. He has published articles and reviews in journals such as the American Journal of Political Science, Political Theory, History of Political Thought, Journal of Politics, Political Science Quarterly, and the Journal of Markets and Morality. He is co-editor of the History of American Political Thought, 
published by Lexington Press in 2003. This is a this is an invaluable volume. Uh, to me, this is the Bible. To be a little bit uh, uh, blasphemous, I guess, at the beginning here, but this is the Bible of American political thought. It's a really useful volume. And Jeff also edited Transforming American Welfare in 1999 and co-authored The Free Person and the Free Economy in 2002. And I understand you're currently working on a book on the natural rights and freedom of religion in the political phone of Sandlock and the American Founders. Uh, so we'll look forward to that, uh, Jeff. That sounds fantastic. But thanks to both of you again for being here today. Thanks for having me. Very happy to, happy to have you with us. Now, today's title, let me just introduce the, the, web, the theme of the webinar before, I, before we kick off our conversation, if you don't mind. The title of today's webinar is Making a Constitutional Republic. And uh, to introduce us to that conversation, we asked participants to read four documents from the living of four American documents. George Washington's farewell address, Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural, uh, Marbury v. Madison, the court case of 1803, and Andrew Jackson's veto method for the bank bill in 1832. And, uh, in, in, in looking at the title of this webinar today, in conjunction with the documents that we've asked participants to read, uh, I couldn't help but notice that there is a big question at the very beginning, and that is, what is a constitutional republic? Uh, in, in other words, what is it that makes this thing that we have here in the United States constitutional in the republic, and how do those two things go together? These are very uh, hard, but I think important questions. Uh, that Americans have actually been arguing over for you know, the, better, the better part of 200 years. And I think the documents that we've chosen for today reflect the kinds of arguments and debates that Americans have had over the meaning of the Constitution. Um, but they also extend, as I was suggesting, the documents that reflect the extent to which Americans have disagreed on what that means. They've disagreed over what a constitutional republic would be like. For example, most Americans agreed in the early years of the Republic that we need separation of powers, and it's written into the Constitution. But what does that really mean? What, how do you think of separation of powers in the context of a constitutional Republic? Um, and again, as I was rereading the documents for today, I was, I was uh, reminded that uh, a lot of people today, today, people we know, um, are shocked and even disgusted with the contemporary state of politics. They think it's low. There's this sort of base political atmosphere these days, full of invective and blame, uh, where people are finger pointing, sometimes even lying, mischaracterizing, or at least stretching the truth when they characterize their political opponents and their views. Um, and it seems to a lot of people that politics today has become extremely personal. And again, I've heard a lot of people say that what we need today is for politicians to put aside their their sort of partisan views on things and replace that with the spirit of compromise and cooperation. And yet, I think, uh, um, again, rereading these documents today, what it reminded me of was that, uh, was that even in the early years of the Republic, politics was just as partisan and personal then as it is now. In fact, in some ways, even more partisan and personal. Uh, and certainly, in some ways, more bitter and, uh, uh, and full of invective. Um, and so, I, I guess I'm thinking maybe one question or a few questions that we could talk about, if you like. We don't have to do it this way. Just throwing out some possible topics for discussion today. One thing we might talk about is um, how did Americans, or how did say George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or the others that were reading here, how would they think about this claim today that we need? less partisanship and more cooperation or compromise in politics. Would they agree with that? Um, what did they have to say about, you know, what kinds of ingredients must go into a, a constitutional republic? Uh, how do they, how do they, that is Jefferson, Jackson, and others, agree or disagree with each other on these questions? Um, and then finally, one other question we might talk about is why? Why do Americans? argue so much, then and now. Why do Americans argue so much about these fundamental questions having to do with constitutionalism and republicanism? Again, republicanism with a lowercase r. Why do Americans argue so much? And why have we always argued so much over these things? Is that an American thing? Or is it just a human thing? Uh, or is there maybe something unique in the way Americans 
argue over these constitutional and, and important political questions. It somehow sets us apart from, from the rest of the world and even the rest of mankind's life history. And so again, just suggestions on how we might go about addressing these documents or building on these documents today. So I just throw it open to you gentlemen for any thoughts that you have on how we might approach this topic or thoughts on any of those questions. Feel free to jump in. Uh, Chris, before anyone does so, would you be kind enough to say a few more words? Because your your uh, your microphone is imperfect, as far as I can tell. Is that true, Jeff? For you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Oh, yeah, I'm I mean, so sorry. I can, I can. No, it's all right. It's somehow when you move your head, it it goes in and out a little bit. I don't know why that. <laughs> so just just be conscious of that, if okay. you don't mind. Yeah, Go ahead, very, well, very good. Sorry, I apologize. I'm not on my computer that I normally use. So in fact, I'm about to switch computers, so maybe that'll resolve the problem. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, uh, ahead. Did you, yeah, I'll switch back. <laughs> uh, uh, did you, I don't know how much of, of that you caught at the end. Yeah, I caught it all. Okay. 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 But I was just suggesting that there's, you know, there's this view today that politics has gotten worse, that it's nasty, bitter. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's the case necessarily. In fact, I think a lot of people would be shocked to see some of the name calling and the disagreeing and, uh, never mind the sort of petty, you know, name calling sort of finger pointing stuff that went on back then. But the degree to which Americans disagreed, and we're talking about thoughtful Americans like Jefferson, Washington, and then Jackson and, and, and McCulloch, for example, and the, and the uh, I'm sorry, uh, Justice Marshall and the uh, Marbury case. Um, they, you know, there were some things that they were willing to talk about on, but there were some things that they weren't willing to talk about. And I, I wonder if, if you have any sense of how they, those, those uh, statesmen, if you will, uh, of the early republic, would think about this call to replace partisanship and politics with them, and with the spirit of, co of compromise and cooperation. Or is this, or is this? This, you know, is, is this just ingrained, this, this partisanship? Is it just ingrained in the way we, we run our constitutional republic? Well, I'll, uh, can I, I'll take a start Please. at that. Yeah, um, especially you. Yeah, I mean, look, we, 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 lots of us, uh, lots of people out there, I'm sure, have read and even teach Federalist Number 10, and anybody who's read that is not surprised by the fact that, you know, free society there are going to be factions and differences of opinion, differences of interest, and all kinds of clashing, um, swirling coalitions that come together and, and where you have freedom of speech and association and press, all that stuff is going to get put out in the public and magnified. So uh, that's, I, I think that's not so surprising. In free society, there's going to be differences. Um, you know, I think in some ways the the bitterness of the founding of, of, you know, the 1790s and later, uh, which I think is what you're referring to, is because, in part because, as Jefferson says in his first inaugural, in part because everybody agreed on a lot of the fundamentals. That, you know, Federalist or Republican, each side claimed that they were Republicans in the small r proper sense. Each side supported the Constitution. Um, the anti-federalists are, you know, essentially gone by then. Each side supports some kind of central government that's, that's got some power. On the other hand, each side still supports the states and the powers that they have. So a lot of these issues, um, they, people have made peace with a large republic and the notion that we're going to spread westward, more or less made peace with that. So a, a lot of those things have been agreed upon. And I tend to think of those the, the partisanship of that era as so bitter because each side thought did not understand why the other side disagreed with them. The Republicans could not understand why, if you were an American and you supported the revolution and the breaking from England, how could you possibly be a Federalist and be, as Jefferson said, right, the aristocratical part of the aristocratical monarchical part? Um, couldn't understand such a thing, and of course, vice versa with the Federalists and the Republicans. So I think it's actually, to a large extent, their fundamental agreement. It's kind of like a, a fight within a family. We all agree on this, on these basic ideas, so how can you be so wrong in your interpretation of what they mean? And those kind of 
internecine civil war, not civil war, but civil conflict, conflicts within a family politically, I think uh, each side thought the other was betraying what they had fought for and what they had tried so hard to establish and had successfully established. You, you see that in, in Washington's uh, farewell address, reminding everybody, you really need the union and you really need the name America. But each side thinks the other has deeply misunderstood the meaning of the word America. So I, I, I take that to be, um, you know, a, a kind of disappointment with the other that, and great anger at the other side. And, you know, you see that in the Jefferson Adams letter back and forth um, and the attempt to reconcile, and they still really don't quite agree with each other. And, and Madison telling Jefferson, how could you have possibly associated with a guy like Adams and, and with his views? And um, Jefferson writes saying back to Madison, well, look, you weren't there at the Continental Congress. If you had, you would have understood why I have such affection for this guy who was the Atlas of Independence. So they were brothers together in that struggle, but then they go different directions and different understandings and really think the other is betraying the cause for which they fought. I think that has a lot to do with the, the deep partisanship that you see um, develop in the founding period. I, I think, let me jump in quickly. Uh, I, I think that's a very good statement. Uh, uh, and I would add to it something like this. It's it's not necessarily as, as coy as I would like it to be. But, um, you know, remember that uh, relative to the regime that they had been living in and indeed participating in, a monarchy, indeed a great empire, indeed even an empire of liberal in a certain way, the British Empire, um, certainly the most liberal empire ever, that given the context of that, um, they knew there were parameters established for the debates that they had before the revolution. In other words, they knew what they could say and what they couldn't. They knew that there was an element of you know, common law sort of habits and self-government and so forth and so on. That they you know, clearly had been participating in for a couple of generations, um, uh, and 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 then as, as time went along, there was a realization that those parameters were restrictive in a massive way relative to what you and I talk about as freedom and self-government, a thing to which they were moving toward already and partly participated in already as a result of English habits and so on. So then the, those parameters are removed. They themselves, the revolutionaries in a very self-conscious way, that's one of the amazing things about these guys, I think, remove those parameters and then have a conversation that can go anywhere. <laughs> you know, that conversation could have ended up in favor of, you know, uh, uh, of, and it almost did at many times, as, as, you know, better than I do, uh, in favor of almost an elective monarchy, for example. So once you remove those parameters, the partisanship of two kinds becomes seemingly extreme relative to what they had experienced before. So the two kinds of partisanship are, are, are you know, the, the, just one of interest, which, of course, those become freed in a way, <laughs> in a different way than, than before. And the other one is, 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 is of, of the intellect partisanship of the intellect. I mean, people actually forcefully disagree with one another about both the ends and means, even the ends of government. Um, and then they settle on to certain kinds of ends, which we, you know, roughly call freedom, limit, based on equality and liberty, you know, etc. cetera, mm -hmm. self-government, roughly speaking. But that what is it that they're arguing? You, somebody, you said, why are they arguing? Or Chris did. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. And, sure. and that's a good question. Why are they? Well, one, the one, one reason they're arguing is because they can. You know, they find it easy to say, hey, excuse me, you know, we are human beings. We're not calling ourselves American. And our purpose is to argue. Well, you know, to paraphrase Johnny Cash, we're born standing up and talking back. That's what we do, you see. And why do we do that? Well, because somehow, we, we understand this thing that we call freedom to be, uh, for that to be an essential component of freedom. 
And then the next question, as, 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 as you put it, is, is that we have to agree. And then the question is, agree on what? See? And that becomes very difficult because even if you can make you know, an abstract argument that we agree with regard to equality and freedom, for example, and equality and liberty, and you can make a Lockean argument about all that, you know, um, justice is somehow the preservation of property and, and you know, uh, keeping the fruits of the labor and blah, 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 uh, no aristocracy. Uh, no blue bloods by 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 nature, except in the sense that Jefferson talks about it as a, in terms of excellence, of course, uh, natural aristocracy, as it were. Um, uh, what 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 we must do is find a basis of agreement, and even the basis of that agreement is manifestly imperfectly understood by virtue of the fact that in practice you continue to contradict it. So you say it's freedom, all men should be free, and, you know, there's basis for that that we, you know, sort of touch on. God has created the human mind freely and so on. Um, human beings ought to be free, in other words. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we're enslaving a bunch of them. So we sort of put an end to half of that, and the other half we can't put an end to. And, and so that, there's a complexity to that equality and liberty clause that begins to set the limit and to set in and begin to set in stone constitutionalism because you know you're you're imperfect in practice and that's a that's a confusing thing to a human mind i mean a human mind you know can justify anything um you know you know paraphrasing franklin you know so can be, uh, human beings are reasonable and and uh, it is a convenient thing i think he said to be a reasonable human being, because you can justify anything in a way. So in that Hobbesian way of, you know, reason is nothing but the handmaid of the passions, right. even, see? So you can fall into that trap, and of course, the, if I may say so, uh, the slave owners actually do fall into that trap and then begin to justify first on the basis of interest and then on the basis of right or ought, this issue right. of, of slavery. And and so that's why, by the way, just to finish that whole circle of of, of thought on my part. That's why when Lincoln comes into politics in 1854, he does it because if he doesn't, then the principle <laughs> that freedom is good and slavery is wrong, you see, is in jeopardy. Because the compromise that is proposed with the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 neglects the principle by virtue of this long, by then, three generation plus practice in 76, at least. Does that make any sense? Well, so, yeah, yeah. The only thing, can, I, the only thing I would, I would say that about, I only I qualify in that is, I think until the 1820s or so, you, you actually the revolutionary, the founding generation actually does agree on ends. They might disagree a little bit on the meaning of those ends, but if you said to them equality and liberty, yes or no, they're going to say yes. That's I agree. Right. I, Con, you know, constitutions and the rule of law, yes or no, yes. Freedom of speech, yes. Freedom of press, okay, so what does that all mean? Well, you know, you can have fight over the Alien and Sedition Act and whether you can call John Adams a, a buffoon or something. But basically, you know, you're right, they throw off, with the, they argue because they can, but they do settle on certain things. They disagree about means, you know, um, a national bank, yes or no. It's an argument really over means, not really ends, right. um, despite some of the partisan press and characterizations of it. But then I think you're right. When you get to later in the 1820s and James Madison's last public act is to go to the Virginia Constitutional Convention in 1829 and give a speech imploring them not to turn from the principles of the founding, turn away from those when they talk about slavery and when they think about slavery. And, of course, he fails, right? Um, then the ends start to change. That's right. Right, and then it's partisanship of a. We don't just disagree on the, on the meaning exact meaning of the ends. We actually disagree on the ends themselves. That's very clear. That's right. That's really clear. That's very useful. Yeah, Jeff, you mentioned one other time. Let me just say in passing. I know we don't want to talk about this right now, but at a future time we can. There's only one other time in which the the ends are disagreed with, and that's what we call loosely the progressive. Uh, 
period. So just put that in the back of your No, that's a great point. Envelope. That was all, both of what you said is really useful and helpful. I actually had not thought about the idea of, uh, as Peter raised earlier, the idea that you know the, in the British tradition they have these parameters that have been established by a traditional understanding of the relationship of monarchs with legislatures and so on and so forth. And the, and the just point about the um, the disagreement over means to shared ends was also very useful. But my my question, Jeff, to you is you know you mentioned the national bank is. Uh, is really just a question of, of, of policy, right? So it's a question of whether it's a neutral means or not. Why, did, why do you think Jefferson, both of you actually, why do you think Jefferson made this out to be, you know, uh, you know I don't want to characterize him as being a drama queen or anything, but, he, you know, for him, the National Bank was, this was a, you know, this is the biggest issue that, you know, uh, that, you know that, that, that we're facing. It's a matter of principle for Jefferson uh, in, in a certain sense, right? He's opposing the National Bank because, as he argues in his opinion on it, if we go with this, then the meaning of constitutionalism that we know it is done, it's over already, just three or four years after we ratified it. I mean, did Jefferson really believe that, or was his disagreement more just a matter of policy? Well, he... I think you probably, I mean, we read Andrew Jackson's veto method as one of our documents for today, and I think he probably believed it on principle more than Andrew Jackson did. I mean, Jackson used it as a matter of interest and probably constitutional principle too, but I think Pawnee actually wrote that veto message, at least the constitutional part, right? Roger Pawnee, who was um, well, Jackson's uh, attorney general, right? Right. And so, uh, you know, I mean, Jackson focused on political interests and, and otherwise interests um, and disagreement over that policy. But I, yeah, Jefferson, you're right, Jefferson disagreed with it because he thought once you start to interpret the Constitution in anything but a very strict way on this kind of issue, you will subvert the, the character of the republic. Because you'll, it, you know, power will be concentrated in some central government that ends up being run by some kind of aristocratic oligarchic elite. Um, kind of arguments you heard with the, with the, uh, anti-federalists, except that the anti-federalists thought that's inevitable. Jefferson, if you have a sense, strong central government, Jefferson said, it's not inevitable if we interpret the Constitution the right way. So I think he really believed it. Um, on the other hand, Unlike the slave, the later arguments in the 1830s and 40s and 50s over slavery, the, the proponents of the National Bank, like Hamilton, they didn't say, yeah, 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 we're trying to subvert the republic and turn it into a commercial oligarchy like the British mercantile system. They, they didn't say that. And, and, you know, notwithstanding some Jefferson scholars, including some of perhaps our colleagues here at Ashland, uh, I'm not even sure that they really were trying to do such a thing. They were just trying to have an effective political economy and fund the public debt and develop the, develop the country. So, and they didn't think any of those, those things were contrary to the ends that everybody had agreed to when, during the revolution and setting up the Constitution itself. So, I, 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 Jefferson might have seen Hamilton that way in his project, but Hamilton did, I think, did not see his project that way. And so, that's, you know, you might say, well, let's say, the guy might be wrong and he might actually be part of actually subverting the republic when he's not trying to, but that's a different thing from saying, yes, I am trying to change what we have set up. That's why, of course, Hamilton and, and the proponents of the bank couldn't understand the violent opposition of the Jefferson, because they thought, look, this is just follows from, uh, uh, from the basic ideas of, 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 that we adopted in the founding period. And, for evidence of that, look at the McCullough versus Maryland decision by John Marshall. It's, it's a unanimous decision. Even Republicans who had been appointed by Jefferson ended up uh, voting for the, for the bank as a matter of constitutional principle, whether or not they thought it was good policy. And of course, Jefferson was shocked, right? John Marshall had seduced uh, the, even the good guys that I appointed to the, to the court. But that's because I think they thought yeah, this was not really an attempt to overthrow the constitutional principles of the regime in the way that Jefferson thought. And look, later on, people like Madison even changed their mind a little bit on the bank and on the constitutionality of it and on the use of internal improvements. So um, that was a, I think that was a moment in time for the Jeffersonians and Jefferson that they kind of outgrew a little bit. So, Jeff, are you saying that, um, that 
that Jefferson, Jefferson had a particular approach to how we should interpret the Constitution that was informed my, more by his understanding of, of what republicanism meant. And republicanism for Jefferson meant, um, I, I guess, I don't want to mischaracterize it, but a kind of stronger reliance on the people from the ground roots level up, but also especially in Jefferson's mind, he had this idea as we know of the sort of agrarian gentleman sort of class of aristocrats. Um, not in the European sense, of course, right, as Peter was saying earlier, but that there was something about that that landed gentry uh, that that, uh, that inculcated a certain degree of virtue and self-reliance that Jefferson thought, Jefferson thought was especially important in a republic, and that therefore the sort of Hamiltonian interpretation of the Constitution with its more expansive understanding of the powers of Congress that somehow threatened that, um, that, that vision of Republican society as Jefferson understood. Is that, that, am I characterizing that the right way or? I think so, yeah. I mean, look at the Jefferson proposed the, for Virginia, the ward system, right, of having, cutting up the, the state into little wards and having the people directly responsible for running most of their business, the, the public business and those things. And I, thought, I think on that kind of thing, he was actually serious in his sentiment, if not in the actual proposal. But he really thought a con this constitution is the constitution for a republic. And the sense, and the republic means, as he said in some letter, um, you know, the, the protection of everyone's person and property and their participation in the management of their person and property directly. So the constitution is for a republic, and a republic means the spirit and sense of the people must rule. Of course, it has to be reasonable and rightful, but on the other hand, it has to be the spirit and sense of the people. So you've got to have that kind of uh, uh, understanding and anything that, and therefore, he probably favors local wars more because the sense and spirit of the people will rule, more likely to rule there. Therefore, he favors things like agrarianism, although later, you know, right, he changes his mind a little bit and the need for internal improvement to things. But still, this notion of popular spirit, extending the suffrage, if a person can hold a musket and fight, they can vote, those kind of things. That's the spirit of the people. And if the farther government gets away from the local, the more likely I think the government's mind is not going to reflect that spirit. And that's what I think he saw, that's what he thought Hamilton was doing, pulling the Constitution away from the people yeah. and their spirit. You know, it's, it's like uh, we read Marbury versus Madison for today. And what's a really noteworthy fact is Jefferson did not like the decision as people probably know, but he did not dispute Marshall's interpretation of the place of the Supreme Court in the constitutional order. He never said a word about that, the contrary to what scholars will tell you today, because Jefferson, um, because Marshall didn't say the Supreme Court's the final authoritative interpreter of the Constitution in Marbury. He just said it has a role in interpreting it. Well, Jefferson believed that too, yeah. because that does not mean that the sense of the people won't govern or the Supreme Court will substitute its sense of the Constitution and understanding the Constitution for the people's understanding. It just means the Supreme Court will offer its opinion and then we'll take it from there and see what happens. That's perfectly consistent with Jefferson's understanding, I think, of a Constitution that's for the people to embody the popular spirit and sentiment. And as he says, you know, if that means the popular spirit and understanding changes, the Constitution should change every generation. That's great. So if I could just interject with a question from, uh, from one of our participants. We've been, we've been bringing the people into this a lot, right? So for example, you just mentioned that Jefferson didn't oppose the, uh, Marshall's understanding of the court's role in the constitutional system because it allowed somehow for the voice of the people to manifest itself. Now, a related question uh, from one of our participants is, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's quite long, but, uh, but this person wants to know, uh, is there really such a thing as the American people, and did they really have the kind of particip participatory power uh, that Jefferson may have envisioned and that, that, uh, that we tend to be, you know, sort of describing as being around at the time. Uh, for example, this person says, uh, suggests that the fact that the Federalist appeals with regard to, the, you know, to justifying the Constitution, the fact that they were written in newspapers in an era when far fewer people were literate than today seems to suggest that the fact that uh, that the people really weren't meant to have the kind of role, participatory role, in this constitutional republic, uh, as, um, as some have suggested. And in particular, what this means, what this suggests to me is that Jefferson's view, if this question is right in any sense, then Jefferson's understanding of what a constitutional republic is not the, 
was not the prevailing one. Any, any of you care to address that question? Sure, oh, Peter. Well, yeah, right. It's a, come on. So you, you guys are knaves and fools, you know, for asking me to address something. That's awful. <laughs> That's awful. But, uh, you know, I think that given these kinds of conversations, what this proves us, what proves to me is that I continue to desire that we may become strangers, you bastards. <laughs> so, all right, that's impossible. First of all, let me, as a factual matter, is it actually true that literacy was less then than now? Really? No, that's not true. I believe that not to be true. And if you don't, if you don't trust, uh, you know, data on that or facts on that, just ask one of your 16 or 19 or 21 year old students to read the first paragraph of the Federalist number one and see if he understands it. Right. You see what I mean? And of course, they have to be talked through it a little bit. Um, the other, if I could just say, just sure. one other thing about that, Peter, is that, uh, is that uh, of course, literacy rates in America at the time were, were certainly much higher than they were in Europe. And uh, there were, of course, those who couldn't read, but the benefit of a newspaper was that they would when they would print these these arguments, the Federalist arguments and even the anti-Federalist arguments in the newspapers, what they would do is hang newspapers from posts, right? Outside of bars and pubs and barber shops or whatever. And, and somebody would read out loud for those who couldn't, in fact. Exactly. And so just because literacy rates, uh, you know, it's disputed, but I don't think they were actually that much lower than they are today. But, but actually, for those who could, they, would, they could understand the idea, there's no doubt about it. There's no question about that. But by the way, I actually think they were higher than today because I don't trust today's literacy figures. But that is very high is the point. I mean, uh, but, but on the bigger point on, on, on the question of, and, and, and let me, I'm sorry, before I get to the people point, um, this question of, of the, the literacy or the, or the orality of the culture of the period, including really a good part of the 19th century, at least the early part, I think is a really interesting question that maybe some other time you can have a seminar on. In other words, why, you know, the, the, the reading aloud business and, and why is it that someone like uh, uh, Ben Franklin, uh, uh, for example, or, 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 or uh, the equally uneducated Abraham Lincoln, uh, why, why they, they, they participated in this oral culture the way that they did and what came out of that? I think that's a very important point. So by saying oral culture doesn't mean they were illiterate. Abraham Lincoln was not illiterate. He became literate at age seven or something. But but there, that kind of connection or even disconnection between literacy and orality is very important in American history and it's much ignored. All right, the people. Is there such a thing as the American people and so forth? Of course there is, you know, on the one hand. But it's not, when you say the American people, I think as the Americans in the beginning of things understood it, 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 it wasn't a sort of Rousseauian, uh, European conception of nationhood or something like that. That's not the way Americans talk. Of course, there are American people. And who are these people? Well, these people who actually participate both intellectually and practically in this self-governing and who actually understand that they can understand these things. That's the difference between an American and a Russian is that, or a Hungarian or anybody else you want you know, uh, you know, some Gaul living in, you know, the dark forests of Germany. He doesn't think he can understand this stuff. I, we, you and I as Americans know that, that he can understand this stuff, this Gaul, you see, but he doesn't know it yet. Why is another story? That's the kind of an anthropological question almost. Right. So there is an American people, but of course that's, that's not saying anything interesting in a way to the Americans because They'll say there's an American people on the one hand, and they're sitting around disputing one another over, over everything, you know. Uh, uh, and they break into factions because, you know, the mind and, and passions are connected and so on. And they know that, and it gets complex. But So they divide themselves in a certain way. And then they reorganize themselves occasionally uh, for election purposes in order to create majorities so that lump, some laws can be passed for certain good purposes. And those majorities, as you know, are many, they're not one. They're many majorities, you know, at various levels. And then they dissolve, they become something else. You, you know, you vote for, for uh, uh, um, state legislatures, then vote for U.S. senators, and, and et cetera. So it becomes very complex. But so the people themselves are not that abstract Rousseauian sense of the people. 
you know. It's, they're, they're actually divide. So the, 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 what becomes really important for Americans in this debate issue is consent. In other words, they, they, they have to consent to certain things occasionally right. uh, through their institutional arrangements and so forth. And that consent changes all the time. And the majorities change all the time. Uh, the Rousseauian doesn't talk, you and I are in faculty meetings, one of the most frustrating, and I'm sure this is true of other, others who are teachers, one of the most frustrating things is that they don't want to take a vote on it. What they want to do is they want a consensus, see? And I, I always oppose that, because that means everybody agrees on something. The Americans say to that, that is horse poop. You know, we can't all agree on everything. So the best we can do is do a majority, and we can, and, and on these various levels of majority, mm -hmm. presidential level, and so forth and so on. Hey, Did Peter. You, yes, please. I'm sorry to interrupt, but one time at a faculty meeting, I raised my hand to continue the argument, and the, and, uh, the person running the meeting looked at me and said, I'm sorry, but you've been out consensus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that is, that's wonderful. I'm, I didn't know that, Jeff. That is, that is absolutely wonderful, because that, that's, that's Rousseau at work. And that, yeah. you, know what, you know what Americans call that, Sikenga? They call that tyranny. Yeah, that's, that's what I call it. <laughs> you wanna, you wanna, you've been out consented. You know, I've got a few Hungarian words for that SOP. Really. No, no one who builds a majority in any way, including a stupid faculty meeting, would actually say, you've been out majoritized. So shut up. That just doesn't work. You see what I mean definitionally? Because if you turn around and three minutes later you persuade your colleagues to go in another direction, if you're still within that institutional arrangement that just had, had created a certain majority, you can outvote them and create a new majority. You know what I mean? Yes. By the way, can I, if I can play with this, this is really fascinating. If I can play with this Rousseauian idea a little bit. As you point out, Peter, the Rousseauian idea of the people is, again, it's a, the people of a body a political entity that is separate from what Rousseau calls the legislator, the, legis the ruler, essentially, right? So in the Rousseauian political universe, there are the people, and then there are the rulers. They are two totally separate classes of people. Right. That's right. That's yeah, right. I think, I think that there is a, um, has been a tendency in the 20th century in America for us to move toward accepting that understanding of the relationship between government and us, the people. But I don't think that was the that was the intent, and I and I, so I know it wasn't the intent of the framers of the Constitution. Um, I, I I mean that you're right, of course. Can I butt in? I mean absolutely <laughs> true. I mean so so when you get you know Woodrow Wilson and so forth, you get this organic conception of the state, right? Uh, and anything you know Wilson says to paraphrase, you know that that, that anything that's organic can't have within itself. Um, uh, 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 contradictory elements that to be an organic you have to be a whole and move in the same, same direction of life and all that I mean that's really weird stuff and of course Americans disagree with that and then the other formulation of that in more contemporary um, uh, political conversations is that we should act more as a family that's you know I mean here's where Aristotle and Locke come together you know against that Rousseauian conception we're not a family we're not a family Families don't have disputes within themselves because they don't have disputations over justice. Family values, as it were, are imperfect. You see what I mean? So that's why men have to go out into cities and, and dispute, manifest their reason, and fulfill their potential because they can't do it in a family, as a family is constituted, if it would be, without the polis or the political community. So Americans say poop to that. You've got to be kidding me. We're not a family. That's European nationalism that has manifested itself post Rousseau, post French Revolution, and every formulation that you want, Russian or German, it doesn't make any difference. Whether it's socialism or national socialism, by the way, it's the same thing in my book. It's absolutely the same. The Americans, in principle, are diametrically opposed to that. And so it's a, it's a quickie of what you want to do if you're studying this stuff, you say Locke versus Rousseau. It's imperfect, but that's sort of the way it works. Um, Right. Does that make any sense? I mean, I, I, I think that's a huge point, both practical and philosophical. Yeah. The, the other point I was going to make is that, again, building on that, the and I don't, I don't want to sound pessimistic. I'm not actually, but I do think, again, in the 20th century, 
we have had a tendency to move toward that, that European slash Rousseauian understanding of the relationship of government and the people. And I think some Americans have come to accept that without actually realizing that there is an alternative to that. And the alternative is found in the way that, that, that Washington and Jefferson and Madison and, and, and others thought about, about, about government and the, and the role of the people in the system. And I think because Americans have had a tendency today to think that there is government and the people or rulers and the people, we look back and we want to say, you know, for example, just, you know, we're reading documents written by who? By the people? No, these aren't documents written by the people. These are documents written by who people today have a tendency to refer to as the aristocrats or, you know, yeah. But, but, but look, my, I would argue that the reason that, they, that these people are making these arguments and all of these documents that we especially are reading for today, they're all making the argument with regard to a, 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 part, a particular aspect of the Constitution so that the role of the people who have a say, who consent, and to participate somehow in this whole constitutional republic we have will be preserved. I think they're all coming from that perspective. So, you know, for example, uh, the most obvious one to me is Jackson's veto of the bank, right? I mean, partly uh, Jackson is... Um, let me back up a little bit. Jeff mentioned earlier, Jefferson, you know, when, when Marshall handed down the uh, opinion in, in the uh, Marbury v. Madison case, Jefferson didn't agree with the, with the decision of the court, but he, but he did not challenge the legitimacy of the court to make that decision. Right. And the reason Jefferson didn't disagree with that is because he understood that, that the court doesn't have the final say on things necessarily, right? But the court, but the court is in charge somehow. I have to be careful how I say this because I've heard Jeff's lecture on this. It's really good. Jeff could do this much better than I can. But the court somehow is meant to um, defend the Constitution, understood as the embodiment of the reason of the people itself. That's right. When the court starts moving beyond its role in that sense, when it is when the court would become problematic for Jefferson. But so long as the Constitution is understood as the as the embodied reason of the people somehow, that the court's role is to, is to protect that reason as it's expressed in the Constitution, and therefore to protect the consent of the reason of the, through the reason of the people that has been given to this government. Now later, Andrew Jackson, I think, takes a slightly different position. He, he argues that the court has not only made a wrong decision in, in the McCulloch v. Maryland case of 1819, which is where, where Marshall upheld the constitutionality of the National Bank, in his uh, in his famous veto message of that bank bill in 1832, Mark, uh, sorry, Jackson makes the argument that in some ways it's very Jeffersonian, in some ways it's other. But Jackson makes the argument that the Supreme Court does not have a final say in what the Constitution means. As Jackson points out, every branch of government, every officer of government, is bound to interpret the Constitution as he understands it, to interpret and apply the Constitution as he understands it. And I think by doing by making that argument, what Jackson is doing is saying. Uh, this is the way you, you, you prevent any one branch of government, and therefore government as a whole, from having any ground to claim that they have the final say on the meaning of the Constitution. Because in the end, it really does belong to the people somehow to say what the Constitution means. That's an interesting point. And if you just want to see that on the practical level, the simple fact that there's a farewell address from George Washington, <laughs> the guy yeah. left office, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, in 1783, he hands back his command. Um, these guys, of course, they're not ordinary people in the sense of, you know, they're not they're not cobblers or something, and they're famous and they're important and they're powerful in their way. But on the other hand, uh, Washington does it. Uh, Adams did, and Jefferson certainly does. Um, they return. It, you were talking about before the notion of rulers and rule in an organic whole, and the rulers sort of pull the rule along in this organic whole. Um, yeah, that's right. They don't think like that because they return to the public or return to the private, but they become, in returning to the private in their private station, go back to Mount Vernon, go back to Monticello, they become citizens again. Or they're always citizens, but they become into the private world as members of the whole public again or this thing, the public, but then they have their own private interests and, and endeavors and engagements and Washington's thinking about how to improve Mount Vernon and Jefferson's building on the Monticello, and they're, they're not permanent rulers. So when you say aristocrats, you were right to qualify, I think, it's saying in a certain sense, 
right. because they're not aristocrats in the sense of a permanent class that's separate, that by, by right, therefore, rules and continues always to rule. They didn't think of themselves that way. You know, Tocqueville says this in, in Democracy in America, it's really amazing that the American Revolution was headed by people you would have thought were from a class that would have opposed it. The yeah. Jeffersons and, and, and the, the Washingtons and, and the Lees and, the, and the, the Carters of the world. These aristocratic people actually go on the side of the people against the British. So, and then after the revolution's over, they continue to act like that when the new government is set up. So Washington serves two terms and leaves. And it's such an impressive Republican, small r Republican thing to do that nobody violates it, that nobody even thinks of doing such a thing until we get to, you know, the 20th century and FDR and under pretty extraordinary circumstances. Yeah, by the way, Jeff, that's a wonderful point. And that reminds me again that these, all of these documents are Republican, again, with lowercase r, Republican in another way. And that is, again, that they are actually written with the intent of reasoning to the people. None of them pander to the people. Again, none of them what? Say that again. None of them what? None of them pander to the people. None yeah, of them yeah. are, you know, look, in that Rousseauian sense of things, and I don't want to dwell too much on that Rousseau distinction, but it's important. You know, you have the rulers, you have leaders, legislators, rulers, and you have the people. And the job of the rulers and legislators is to divine somehow, to interpret this general will thing, but somehow to in interpret what the people need and to make sure that what the people get is not necessarily what they want, but what they need, what is in their best interest. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, in the Rousseauian uni political universe, the, the rulers, the leaders, you know, they are experts in a certain sense. They know what is best for the people, and, and they don't really want to, you don't really want to give the people an opportunity to have too much of a say, because the people can screw it up. But what you see, they can screw it up for themselves. But what you see in all these documents, including the Supreme Court opinion, is that these are all, these are all written in a way that is meant to appeal to the reason of the people. None of these are really appealing to the passions of the people. Every one of them in their own way is appealing to the reason of the American people, which is built on the assumption that the American people are actually capable of reasoning. Yeah, I think that's a great point, uh, Burkett, just a quick point on that. And I, I think that that's not often seen somehow. People ignore that. I mean, there is no pandering going on. There's no pandering. I would like somebody to write a book on that. You know, why is there no pandering? Why is it that the little arts of popularity um, you know, are not practiced. It's very interesting. And even if they're practiced or seem to be practiced, let's just say loosely, say by somebody like a Tom Paine occasionally, even if it's for a good purpose, it's it's questionable. Sure. In other words, people say, you know, that's dangerous. You don't want to do that because as the court is supposed to be, uh, you know, an embodiment of reason, all other institutional arrangements within this Republican form are supposed to embody reason. That's why consent is everything. And, and therefore, as, as Jeff put it, you know, rule and be ruled in turn is everything. Nobody should think that he rules forever just because he rules now, even if he, rule, if he has huge power and so forth. Uh, it's funny, people are still surprised by that when, when you know, people give up power willingly in, in any institution. Yeah. Fascinating. Good, good point. As, as, as Jeff pointed out, as Washington did twice, right? I mean, look. Again, you just take this Marbury Madison opinion of, 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 of Chief Justice Marshall. Never mind the details of how he of how he arrived at his conclusion. The fact is, he reasons through this step by step. Now, why does he do that? Is it, is it because Marshall feels compelled to persuade Congress that he's right, or that he's compelled to persuade President Jefferson that he's right? These these you can tell a Republican, again, lowercase r Republican Supreme Court decision. Because you can tell somehow that these are written to the people. Uh, and you think about this. You know, you know Chris, sorry, i got to interrupt. Marshall read that opinion out when it was delivered. He read it out loud on the second floor of a tavern. Yeah. So yeah. More, Perfect. If more Supreme Court justices did that today, we'd be much better off, I think. I know um, who would be willing to. Clarence has said he would. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but, you know, Marshall is, is writing um, – well, it's, you know, we all know that Alexander Hamilton in Federal 78 made the argument that the Supreme Court is the weakest branch of government. Uh, you know, the president has the power of the sword, has executive power, the, the, the Congress has the power of the purse and the power to make laws affecting life and death. 
And, 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 and Hamilton suggests that the Supreme Court, all it really has is the power of the pen. And that's, and that's absolutely true. That is, you know, there's, how does the Supreme Court derive so much authority in this constitutional system of ours? Its entire authority, really, I think as the framers envisioned it, it was, is based on their ability to persuade American, the American people that their decisions are right and reasonable. Without that kind of power, the Supreme Court ultimately is wholly meaningless and powerless in our constitutional system. And so I think, again, you, you know, we can, you can go through and compare some Supreme Court cases. I think you could actually go through, this would be another fun project for somebody to, to, to write about. You can see court case, Supreme Court decisions, some of them in the 1800s, a lot of them in the 1900s, where, where the courts are, are engaging in sort of, you know, smoke and mirrors sort of stuff to confuse the American people. But I think you can distinguish really important, uh, sorry, Supreme Court decisions uh, that are written, again, explicitly uh, intending to appeal to the reason of the people and persuade the American people in that old-fashioned sense of real political rhetoric, right, that appeals to the reason. Uh, I think you could, you could do a study on some really important Supreme Court decision decisions in that sense. The same thing with Washington's farewell address. Why does Washington bother to write a farewell address? Is it because, I mean, you know, some scholars in the 20th century would argue, well, it's because he's an ego maniac, he's concerned with his legacy. Maloney. You know, Washington is making an appeal to his fellow citizens, his friends and fellow citizens, as he starts with. Right. Friends and fellow citizens. Uh, it's not, not simply, you know, saying, here's, here's what you're going to do. He's saying, please, I'm begging you, I'm exhorting you, right? I conjure you, he says a few times. To, to, to heed my advice. This is advice. This is not sort of um, you know, uh, divine word handed down from some god, so to speak, right, to a people who are incapable of thinking for themselves. Washington is trying to persuade them to be reasonable in the future and follow some pieces of advice that he's accumulated, uh, some wisdom, follows advice from wisdom that he's accumulated from his several years of experience in politics. Now, he actually says at one point, these considerations speak a persuasive language to every reflecting and virtuous mind. There you go. Perfect. Wonderful. Yep. So, so, you know, this notion that these people are aristocrats, that they're somehow, uh, uh, you know, a separate class from the people, I, I think the documents themselves were read carefully in the spirit in which they were originally intended. Uh, it, it really deflates that argument somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, look, Washington, Jefferson's first inaugural address. Uh, you know, what, Je there's something really unique about Jefferson's first inaugural address uh, that I actually didn't catch until our friend David Tucker mentioned this to me um, uh, uh, last year, and that is that, that Jefferson's first inaugural address is really the first use that a president has made of this opportunity to appeal to the reason of the people after a very, very bitter and partisan election, right? Again, you know, we, we have bitter partisan elections today. The election of 1800 was, it was brutal. And, uh, and Jefferson won and the Federalists came out ahead. I'm sorry, the, uh, Jeffersonian Republicans came out ahead in the election. And Jefferson used the opportunity of the first of his inaugural address to appeal to the reason of the American people to put aside, to a certain extent, the bitterness and partisanship that had divided them during the period of the election, and, and now to reunite on those common principles that make them all Federalists and make them all Republicans. It's a beautiful thing Jefferson is doing here, if you think about it. But again, he's not, this is not pandering. This is an attempt by Jefferson to argue to Americans, to, to persuade Americans why they should reunite on principled grounds. Uh, and this is, this is again, it's, 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 it's not in the least bit Rousselian to the narrative. That's right. That's very good. That's very good. Yeah, can I just read a, a little bit from that first inaugural? Because they, right on the point that you were talking about, this is Jefferson. He says, um, during the contest of opinion through which we have passed, the anim animation of discussions and of, and of exertions has sometimes borne an aspect which imposed on strangers unused to thinking, to think freely and to speak and to write what they think. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. By the way, um, if you don't mind, I have some questions following up on some of our comments. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just throw them out there if you want to talk about them. Um, one, one participant uh, commented, so with elected leaders serving for decades today, have we not become the aristocratic leadership in modern times? And a kind of related question, uh, do those um, sort of modern senators and reps, do they therefore think they're more entitled 
to certain things than Washington and Jefferson envisioned. And another related question is, do you think that the framers of the constitutional system that we have um, uh, were somehow blinded to the potential problems with, with sort of professional politicians that we're dealing with today? How do we think about that? I mean, is there, is there, is there some blame to be laid at the doorstep of the framers of the Constitution for the kind of things that we're seeing in the 20th century? How do we think about that? Well, I, I mean, I, Jeff, why don't you go ahead and I'll be back in one second. Sure. Can... Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, that's a good, those are good questions. Um, you know, the rise of the professional politician, lots of people have talked about it, scholars have written lots of books and articles about it. Um, do we blame the founders for that? Well, um, you, I mean, you could, you can blame them in the sense that they didn't put in the Constitution term limits for presidents, for reps, for senators, or something like that. And lots of people, of course, have proposed those kind of things to sort of constitutionalize an opinion that probably was palpable among the founding generation, um, uh, that, you know, there shouldn't be professional politician classes. And in, in some ways, of course, um, the thought was, why would you be a professional politician? Those are all the things to do with your life. <laughs> you know, I want to get back to Mount Vernon. I want to get back to Monticello. I want to go back and be a merchant again. I want to go back into law practice. You know, now every, nowadays, for example, everybody, because the Supreme Court has become so powerful, just as an example, the idea that someone would leave the Supreme Court. I mean, I guess David Souter did, and people were really shocked. But, you know, John Jay left the Supreme Court to become governor of New York because it was a better job. It was, it was more interesting and important. I think that, you know, I would say the rise of the professional politician as a class of, as a kind of person and a class of people tracks the rise of the power of the central government over the course of the 20th century and of the administrative state that arises out of the progressive movement so that, you know, um, it becomes much more in people's interests to in part in their interests and also because they're persuaded of a certain argument that there needs to be experts who rule these things and the longer I'm in Congress the more the better expert I am rather than being led astray from something. Um, that that idea I think that rise of the professional politician class is is partly caused by the growth and rise uh, and the significance of complicated administrative states that require that seemed to require at least those kind of people there in order to run this. It's not, I mean, you certainly did have long serving politicians before that happened. You had Henry Clay. Yeah, in the house the, you know, right? He's in the House or the Senate basically from what, 1803 through 1850 with a few interruptions. But of course, at the same time, Congress doesn't meet all that often. He's right. spending most, a lot of his time actually back in Kentucky, you know, getting Ashland up to be a working uh, plantation and farm and working on local issues and still being an active lawyer. I mean, even the professional politicians, and nobody was more a professional politician than Henry Clay, even those people still had normal human lives. Right, right. Even in their occupations, they still did things like be lawyers. So, and that, I think, is quite different from today's class. So, yeah, I think we have seen with the rise of the administrative state and centralized power many more incentives for people to become entrenched in a way and think that it's not a bad thing that they are there and entrenched there. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. I was thinking of Clay as well. I was thinking of Clay and, you know, think of John C. Calhoun and Daniel Webster. These guys dominated uh, politics for a good, you know, a couple of decades, two, three decades in the 1800s. But I, and I would, I would just back up what you said, and that is the reason those people were continually returned to office is because they made principled arguments. All of them made principled arguments, and they were they were kept in office because they were able to persuade their, their constituents, um, even the senators, right? They were able to persuade enough people of their state to get elected as senators that, that they were there representing certain kinds of principles. And their arguments were almost always rooted in certain understanding of principles. Today's, a lot of, again, I don't want to sound overly pessimistic, but Jeff, I think you're right. Uh, I, have, I have read, by the way, as I know, as I know you're all familiar, uh, there's, a, there's an argument out there among scholars, certain scholars, that um, it actually is very difficult today. It's actually, <laughs> if a politician does things right, it's actually very hard not to get reelected these days. If, in other words, if you, if you play in the sort of, 
administrative system the right way, and you know how to uh, uh, to, to use uh, the administrative state to the advantage of your constituents, it's, it's, it's by doing constituent services, right, and these sorts of things, it's very, it's actually hard for a lot of people not to do that. And I think the reason we have these long-term politicians today is because they do, they, they try to do more for their constituents, whereas for people like Clay and Webster and, and Calhoun and others, they were making arguments on principle. It's a massive difference in my book. But go ahead, Peter, sorry. This is a hard question. I'm listening. I, even when I wasn't here, I heard you guys, but most of it. Um, look, I mean, I, I think, you know, I've always opposed term limits, I just want to say. So when politicians over the decades have come to me and said, you know, what do you think? And, what? and I've always said no term limits. And, and, of course, most of those politicians were Republican. Not most of them. All of them were uh, in favor of term limits because they got exasperated losing. <laughs> so, really? Really? And I used to mock him, you know, and I still do. I, I said, so you're, you're exasperated losing. Well, dog my cats. Make an argument that's persuasive to the people. Otherwise, if you're exasperated losing, because you cannot make arguments that are persuasive to the people, you then condemn the people as being corrupt and unvirtuous, you see. And then now you have disengaged yourself, if you do that, from the people. Yeah, the people can become corrupted. I mean, what, this is rocket science, you know? Of course, they can. you can give them stuff, and they, you know, they, they, it, it, it can be, he can be Chris Burkett or Peter Schramm. He can become corrupted. I mean, we know this. So one of the things that you do is you fight that tendency to keep giving stuff to people. Uh, on, on the other hand, that's not enough. And in a regime in which he is dominated by that, you have to stand up, and, and if I may, say with manly eloquence, as Madison calls it, you know, argue. And argue even against the people's interest, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, yeah. But not enough of them do it is the problem. So uh, there's, this is really a fundamental problem that, that addresses the character of our, both our politicians and the character of the American people, as it were, right? And whether they lack virtue enough for self-government. I do not think that they do. I think that, but that's enough. But 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 are they corrupted? Yeah, all people are corrupt. Some are less corrupt than others. You know, you know what I mean. So, but you know, but but you're right. If you speak to them, even people who are a little bit corrupted uh, or more than a little, if you speak to them as an adult who go in the way that Washington speaks to them, you know, in his farewell address, um, they can be changed. That's exactly right. Or, or put, but are drawn back to their self, their true self. That's right. That's right. They can be and even. Look, that, you talk, look at this is making a constitutional republic with seminars. You can't make a constitutional republic unless you have adults. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree completely. And the purpose of government is to make adults, not to make dependent children. I understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we have several questions relating that. In fact, one. Um, one was leading right down that road about about whether the, this person asked whether it's inevitable that we eventually um, become the kind of society that we've become where where, uh, where people are more reliant on government giving them things or doing things for them rather than uh, sort of making stands on uh, on principle with regard to you know um, uh, questions of justice as opposed to expediency uh, being too vague. But but this person wants to know, for example. The role of education in a constitutional republic. How important is education? We know it's important, but uh, what would the founders and framers and the early republic have thought of this? Well, yeah, that, that's you know, look, Jefferson um, wanted three things on his tombstone. Everybody who's been to Monticello, you, you've seen this, right? He says, an author of the Declaration of Independence, and he said, I don't want anything else on my tombstone. Author of the Declaration of Independence and of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia, right? Those three things. Um, not president. Not president, not secretary of state, not governor, not, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, yeah, that's right, because um, all of those things are connected by the common notion of, of, of enlightening, enlightenment of the people, so that they think like adults and act like adults, and self-governing human beings, right? And Jefferson proposes, you know, his, well, I think one of his bitterest disappointments, he says in a letter later in life is, 
1779 during the revolution, he, he sort of takes charge of rewriting the, the, the laws of Virginia. And one of the things that he proposes is a scheme of education for the people, right. you know, for the ordinary common person, all the way up through, as Peter mentioned before, the natural aristocracy. Um, uh, and he, this scheme of education for them will be so that they can understand the principles of freedom and uh, of their rights, so that they can understand their responsibilities as citizens, so they can so they can read and write and those things, but it's civic in its character and in its purpose. And I think, it, as you said, one of his bitter disappointments was the uh, legislature of Virginia passed a lot of his laws that they never passed that one. Yeah. And he tried to get UVA at the end of his life to sort of at least be part of that system, um, right. at least get a little bit of it, if not all of it. So right. it's absolutely essential for a constitutional republic in someone like Jefferson who has a very limited view of what government should do, right, among the founders. Uh, even he thinks, and Madison with him, that government ought to play a role in it, and that there ought to be just in general civic education, not meaning just go out and participate kind of thing, but intelligent understanding of what the principles of the country are, what they mean, where they come from, and how we see those things in, in the country's institutions. You, can't, you cannot have a republic, um, a public thing, without a public. And you can't have a public without that kind of education. That's really clear. That, that's a great point. Uh, by the way, Jefferson, thought that was so important, I remember correctly, Jeff, that in his earlier scheme of education, it was going to be provided free for those who couldn't afford it, I believe, right? It would have been a free civic education for those who couldn't afford it. Uh, yeah. If, uh, I mean, that that's really says something for Jefferson. Um, one of the few things Jefferson was willing to do tax tax dollars for was education. Um, the local well, look, I mean, can I can I jump in because this obviously is a huge point and and already uh, you know well discussed by us. But I mean, this is the, the you know, and everybody listening in on this knows this. I know, but but it needs to be said. I mean, this is what we do, right? This is weird. Because this, you know, what the Ashbrook Center does is, is you know, consider this point of what we loosely call civic education, which is too bumper stickerish, but it kind of works for now. So, so we leave it. And why civic education is, by the way, the same as liberal education, rightly understood. And the reason for that is because in both cases, you're 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 educating, you're cultivating a mind, a free mind. You're cultivating a free mind. You're not trying to make a free mind into something unfree. You're just trying to get a free mind, whether it's a 50-year-old or a 15-year-old, to understand itself. Ed ed education in a republic, rightly understood, is self-education. That is to say, it actually, it's really knowing thyself. A, a, a citizen uh, 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 in, in a republic, that is to say, an American citizen in an American republic, the other ones don't count very much. Thank you very much. Just say in passing for reasons we can talk about, but that's a little boring for me. Um, it's a self-education. And I, I, charmingly, you know, my favorite Americans are actually self-educated. You know, George Washington had no education, as we understand that. That's interesting. You know, ben Franklin had no education. Abraham Lincoln had no education. You know, uh, so much for PhD programs, right? I mean, seriously. Um, uh, you know, and Woodrow Wilson, for that matter, right, who had a lot of education, and he was wrong about everything. <laughs> uh, not only means, but also ends, etc. All right. So what I'm trying to prattle here is that is that it is really is self-education. And when we read these documents, well, a, a student, a, a high school teacher, a wonderful person, a couple many years back actually pointed out. He said, "You know, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to understand why you guys try to use documents and everything." And and I, of course, I listened, and I learned because she said. You know, these guys are debating. They're arguing. In other words, you're, you're reading, you're reading Calhoun and you're reading Lincoln and, you know, went through various possibilities of, of dialectical disagreements between Americans about everything important, sometimes even ends and certainly means. Uh, in doing that, you're getting into the habit of thinking, which is yes. what you're supposed to do. Otherwise, consent is bullshit meaningless stuff. 
And I said, that's exactly right. And I'm doing that. You know, I, look, I went, when I went to college, I said this before, but it's too, I mean, it's, it's too choice not to say again. I never read an original. I was a history and political science major five times over. I went to college for six years at a state university, blah, 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 in the 60s. Um, I never read a document. I mean, I'm not kidding. I never read a document. I never read the Declaration. I never read the Gettysburg Address, for gosh sakes, you know. I read uh, Charles Beard's Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, I think it was four times in my six years of undergraduate experience. Really? In the, you know, there were four different classes. And, and it, it, you can see how that's an obfuscation, that's an intentional obfuscation and moving away from the deliberate sense of the people and what people, human beings, these American human beings, are able to think through with regard to the ends and purposes of self-government as well as, of course, inevitably, of course, human happiness. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so and, and look at that notion of, of, of education, civic and liberal, that's the same thing. Um, uh, cult, education of a free person and a free citizen, and a citizen and a free society. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, the notion here, what you just said there, that it's really, that, that kind of education is really um, Reflect thinking about yourself, reflecting on yourself, and what it means to be free. I, I'm struck by this line, these lines from uh, Washington's farewell address, where he says, "From this, you have every inducement of sympathy and interest. Citizens, by birth or choice, of a common country, that country has a right to concentrate your affections. The name of America, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discrimination." And then he goes on to say, and what does it mean then? Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. We have a lot of really good questions. Uh, I don't know that we'll be able to get to all of them, but let me throw a few of them out. Um, I want to point out that, by the way, who are these peasant wogs who are, you know, have the arrogance to ask people like you, me, and such questions? I mean, who, what do these people think they are? What are, what are they, Americans or something? They're the people. <laughs> <laughs> But they're really good. It's, I mean, it's <laughs> my point that there is such a thing as, as, a, as a reasonable people. It's possible. I, I, I love these people, even when they're smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, me, let me start with one that's a little more specific um, with regard to Jackson's veto message. Uh, I'll just read the question. I have seen some historians highlight Jackson's remarks about rich people, right, because you're familiar with that term. One of the things Jackson throws in there is this uh, bank bill will favor the rich. Uh, but, he's, uh, but but modern scholars have used this, have interpreted this, and used it as a kind of uh, anti-capitalist argument. But is that really Jackson's intent in, uh, his, in his veto message? No. Is he more against monopolies than, than wealth? Yeah. I mean, first of all, Jackson's very strongly against, as all the Jeffersonians are, right? Um, they're very strongly against uh, legally created monopolies. So that monopolies that exist by creation of law, they regard as, you know, old-fashioned British mercantilism that's only going to serve the interests of the wealthy. So uh, in that sense, yeah, he's definitely against monopolies, especially legally created monopolies. Um, there's a guy, there's a guy, a scholar named Arthur Brooks, probably some people know him, but he's, he's got this term. He says the, the Jacksonian notion was um, – Jackson was in favor, and all the Jacksonians were and still are today, that's a Jacksonian current in American politics, right? They're, in, they're not against rich people. They're in favor of earned success is the way that he describes it. And I think that really captures nicely the spirit of Jackson's veto. It's not anti-capitalist right. um, in the sense that he's against people going out and making money. What he's against is the manipulation of the law and of government power to, to pick certain people right. to make money. In an unnatural sort of way, right? In an artificial yeah. sort of way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his argument is, his argument absolutely was that in, when government makes, when, when a government, and he thinks the bank is an example of this, it's going to be a government establishing an institution that only certain people, certain classes, like creditor classes, will be able to use to increase their prosperity. Right, well, and where, whereas the ordinary person won't have access to that kind of institution, and therefore it's going to get ripped off or not have the same opportunity. It's not against people going out and making money. Jacksonians, it's just a historical fiction that all the people who supported Jackson were, you know, sort of poor frontier people. That's not true at all. Right, right. 
But by the way, it's amazing how Lincoln like just made Jackson sound. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought I would, uh, I would see that, but that's really good. Um, uh, there are a couple of other questions too. Actually, are pretty, actually three are pretty closely related. So let me just throw these out here. Um, does our government, as set up by the framers, actually require compromise? Compromise between the House and the Senate, compromise between the Congress and the Executive, and compromise between parties when one party doesn't hold power. Um, a, a related question is um, regarding the bitterness of today's politics. Do we think that Madison and the founders and framers foresaw the development of factions or parties and the kinds of partisan conflicts that we see uh, today? I think they're related somehow. I mean, what, how did they? How did the framers envision? Did they envision partisan politics, and did they envision the need for a kind of compromise? Not necessarily consensus, if that was the term Peter was using earlier, but, but some sort of compromise. Yeah. And, well, and can I, let, me, let me address the latter part of the question. Peter should, should take the other part about partisanship, but certainly on compromise, Madison says in Federalist 10 and Federalist 51 explicitly, we're going to set this system up, this large extended republic, so that we can multiply the number of factions, so we don't have a natural majority that sort of out consensuses people in the steamroll. Doesn't mean we're not going to get majorities, because of course we've got to get things done, and that requires majorities, but the majorities will come together, as he says, on matters of interest, money, property, stuff like that. They're going to come together in, there's always going to be, comp, they're going to come together on compromise, but there are going to be two different kinds of compromise. He lays this out in 10 and 51. Yeah. But on matters of interest and money, there'll be compromises based on kind of negotiation, you know. The school board says, we're going to offer you this. The teacher union says, no, we want this. And they somehow find some way to work it out in the middle, some kind of interest, right, in negotiation. On matters of principle or factions of passion, as Madison calls them, there will be compromise, but they'll, they'll reach the compromise by agreeing on a kind of common principle that they can all accept. And the example that Madison gives is, you know, which, which should, should they have a state church? Which, which should be the state religion? And the Anglicans say us, the Presbyterians say us, the Baptists say nobody, at least not you guys, right? And they all fight. And what Madison says is in the end, what they can agree on is religious liberty for everybody. Yeah. And he says that's actually the principle of justice and right. They kind of, they don't necessarily get there by simple argumentation, but by conflict. And then they say, look, you can't be the state church, we can't be the state church, let's just not have one and let everybody have religious liberty. Yeah. So, there, you know, this compromise, absolutely, it's envisioned by Madison, it's understood by Madison, uh, and, but there are going to be different ways that the factions will compromise, but, but they will compromise, and it's a necessary part of the system. And if there's no compromise, if, if politics doesn't have a sort of messy element to it, it either means there's tyranny, or it means there's a national catastrophe that unites everybody immediately. Yeah. For example, you see that after 9-11, right? Congress going out on the steps of the Capitol and seeing God bless America holding hands. That's the last time they've ever held hands, for sure. Yeah, that's a good point. That's very good. Yeah, that's very good. I'm not sure I can add to that. Um, uh, the question of partisanship or, or, or the question of what is a, a political party and how that that was envisioned and why faction was uh, what you and I now call a political party, we think, according to them. Those are very complex things. Frankly, I'm not even sure I can answer that. The politics of the 1790s being what they were, that becomes a very complex issue. In other words, the factionalism in the ordinary sense of pursuing, of pursuing one's interests and, and trying to prevent the majority from becoming a faction in itself is back again speaks to this question of reflection and deliberation and choice. But one of the appealing things about the Jefferson's first inaugural, of course, is, is that he now says, listen, listen, people, we really are now uh, uh, both Federalists and, and, and what does he say, Republicans? Mm -hmm. yeah, we are all Federalists, we're all Republicans. That's right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm, yes. I mean, and, and you think, well, that's a sort of nice bumper sticker thing. Well, he actually means that. And then when he reflects on the meaning of that election, that is to say, really the first election that we had in which something like factions or slash political parties became full participants in, and one party, the Federalists, had actually left power 
peacefully to these newly elected anti-federalists or Republicans is a remarkable um, revolution in human affair that he thinks is, is comparable or even more important in 1776. It's not more right. important because it's based on the principles of 76, but it is it is actually a, a, a sort of a, if you like to be cute here, a Hegelian Augenblick. Yeah. You know, it's an Augenblick. It's one of those momentous things. Not yeah. not Napoleon riding into Jena on a white horse, but, you know, American human beings slash citizens voting out one party, the party of George Washington. The party of George Washington and John Adams voting them out of office in, in favor of the party of Jefferson and so forth. That's a, a peacefully, in other words, peacefully. Nobody fired a shot. Nobody said, I'm not leaving office because these guys are so bad that they're traitorous and they can't be trusted. That's in Rousseauian universe, that's what would have happened, of course. Right. So, <laughs> go ahead, please. I was just going to say, by the way, this, and this reminds me of the, of the points we were making earlier about the, about the real role of the, of the people in this constitutional republic. This is how Jefferson described what he called the, you know, he called the election of 1800 the revolution. It's a revolution of 1800. That's and right. How significant. And later he described it as a revolution, not affected indeed by the sword, but by the rational and peaceable instruments of reform, the suffrage of the people. Yeah. So, it's, it's again, it's, it's highlighting again the role that the people can have through this consent that we've worked into our system, can have in affecting a kind of revolution. Absolutely. And the fact that we're not, I, mean, I remember, you know, piddling around in various Eastern European states in 89 and 90, and the thing that was absolutely shocking to them is, is that, is that, um, is that American presidents, uh, you know, lose an election and, and then they stick around for a new guy to come in, they shake hands, and, uh, you know, before the guy takes the oath of office, they get in a car and go home, you know. And and it always happens. I mean, it's really remarkable. And then the, the other thing they say is you, you even had elections during the Civil War. I mean, how preposterous is that? We couldn't do that. And the question becomes, why couldn't they and why can't we? And I think Jeff, Jefferson has it has it nailed down there. Yeah, there's a certain kind of sense uh, that this is the, the, the real self-government aspect in the public sense, that you rule, then I rule in turn, and this is the way it works. So this is, and it's not unrelated to the question of, of limiting rule, uh, you know, the, the previous question uh, 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 having to do with, what is it called in the contemporary world, uh, uh, you know, uh, the president can run but for two terms, and Oh, term, yeah. limits, term limits. Yeah. Term, term limits, limits are, are are fundamentally anti self government because the people have to have the the uh, the authority to to do the right thing and sometimes they actually do the wrong thing and elect somebody four times and so forth and so on. And Washington knew that and that's why he said I'm not running anymore. Because yeah. he would be just he kept getting elected until the day he died. And is that a good thing or not? I mean, whatever George Washington may have been in his, in his imperfections, this guy was a Republican. Right. He wouldn't allow that. Yes. No, that's a great point. Yeah. The only, thing I, the only thing I would add to that is a matter of looking at the history of the founding is on, on partisanship and faction. They, you know, whether or not they anticipate, I mean, Washington might not have thought much about political parties, but, you know, immediately you get to the 1790s and you have people like James Madison who's organizing a political party um, and, and you know, working this together. So I think what happens is Madison should think, you know, among the Americans there are going to be different opinion and passion and interest and there are factions and what happens with political parties is, and people have written a lot of histories of political parties, of course, is that the factions become partisan in the sense of becoming part of a political party. Yes. And then what we have instead of talking about factions is we talk about political parties, and then we talk about the factions inside the political party. And there have been lots of great histories, including a new book out talking about maybe the best way to understand uh, small p American politics is not to look at the history of political parties, but to look at the history of factions and how they have changed the political parties back and forth. What book is that? Yeah. Uh, by uh, Dan uh, DeSalvo. Oh, huh. no, I don't know it. I don't know it. The other, the other thing that has to be said, I think, just in passing at least, is that today's understanding of partisanship is a little different from that. 
yes. people that don't like partisanship in today's world want to sort of depoliticize everything, which means pull consent out of the framework, right? And and the deliberative sense of the of the public. Uh, the, the, you know, let's get together and do things without partisanship. Uh, let's turn things over to the experts. And you know, gosh, we can't we can't draw congressional uh, lines, uh, you know, because it's too partisan. So let's have courts do it and so forth. Or, that, or unbiased committees. Unbiased, unbiased committees. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's 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 really entertaining, by the way, in principle. Yeah. I'll be crude about it. The monarchic principle into American politics. Yeah. That's you're trying to depoliticize something that by very nature cannot be depoliticized if indeed all men are created equal and free and so I think that's, that's so, so I, it always it always strikes me that appeal to post partisanship and post ideological part of <clears throat> politics and to some extent bipartisanship, not understood as a compromise between partisans but sort of as transcending partisanship. All of those labels are always used for <laughs> Capital P, capital I, political and ideological reasons. That's right. That's right. I agree. Of course. Of course. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think uh, we have this notion today for, for a number of reasons, and <clears throat> you brought some of them up, uh, <clears throat> that, that you can actually somehow do away with partisanship. And I think I think the, 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 the founders and the men of the early republic, the leaders and statesmen of the early republic, understood that, that there will always be partisanship where people are free to express their Political, their political, to work out for themselves what their political opinions are in the first place, and then to communicate them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because partisanship is rooted in human nature, and that, again, as Jeff pointed out, reminds me again of Federalist Number 10, <clears throat> where Madison said, look, so long as you have liberty and people are free to, to um, uh, you know, form their own opinions about things, and, uh, and, and people are, uh, you know, Human nature is what it is. You're going to have faction. You will have faction in this country. So Jeff pointed out the solution to that is, as Madison suggests, is to multiply those factions or minimize those factions and, and by multiplying them to the extent that that's possible. He did make the this Madison does make the distinction between a faction and a party. There's a there's a newspaper editorial that Madison writes. I, I forget what year. I want to say 1794. Called parties. Uh, where Madison says, look, let's just admit it, we are going to have political parties in this country. But a party is not necessarily a fact. A party is a, party is a group of people animated by a common interest and, and, and possibly, hopefully, by a common, a common set of, of, of principles or beliefs. A faction is a group of people common, uh, uh, united by a common passion or interest that wants to do something adverse to the rights of others of other minorities, of other individuals, or other groups, adverse to the natural rights of others. That's a faction, as Madison defines it in federal sense. A, a party doesn't have to be a faction. Uh, in fact, I think Madison hoped, he says we're going to have parties in this country, but I think Madison hoped that parties would not simply be degenerate into factions, that you could have, that you could have more than one party that, that, was, that was animated at least by principles. And, uh, and at any rate, at the very least, what all parties should have in common is is exactly what Matt, sorry, exactly what Jefferson described in his first inaugural address. Um, all to Jefferson says, will bear in mind this sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable, and that the minority possess their equal rights, which equal law must protect, and to violate with the oppression. I mean, that's Jefferson. That's Jefferson's restatement on, uh, on uh, I think his restatement on. Uh, what all Americans ought to have in common, regardless of what party they're, they're affiliated with. I mean, when Jefferson says we are all federal, we're all Republicans, in, in one sense he's saying, look, Republicans won this election. But, but to the extent that there will continue to be parties, that's fine so long as all parties recognize that, that, that they do not have the right in our constitutional system to do things that violate the, the natural and equal rights of others, and, and especially the minorities. Exactly, exactly. I think that's very clear, Chris. And furthermore, again, for uh, contemporary uh, purposes, I mean, if one party becomes a faction, that, you have an interesting problem there. Because very that true. party will assume that, that people in, in that party might, might categorize people into parts and just give them stuff. And and whether whether they're whether they're gender based, class based, race based, 
the assumption is that those human beings who now participate in this getting something from the body politic no longer can think clearly, you see, that their mind is no longer free by virtue of their class, race, or gender. And so that's all you can, can have is factionalized politics instead of majoritarian politics, which assumes that the, the judgments and, and uh, principles and so forth can be debated. Yeah, yeah there's a good speech by John F. Kennedy, actually, in 1960, where he taught, he says, everybody asks me my opinion about particular issues. Nobody asks me what my opinion is about the office of president. And one of the things he says about that is, um, a, a president should be political. And but he says, by that I mean the head of his party and not pretend to be otherwise. But when he's the head of his party, what he ought to do is make an argument to the public, in case in the case, case, obviously, as a Democrat, he should make an argument to the public why they should all become Democrats. That's right. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's very good, which FDR, for example, did, you know, really brilliantly. Yeah, so there's a kind of open partisanship, but it's, it, it's, it, it's reasonable and tries to make it based on arguments and says the political, political principles of the Democratic Party in this case are for the public good, we're not taxes, exactly. and here's why. Exactly. Exactly. And if but the opponents to that position cannot make a counter argument, then you can see what the consequences of that are. But that's, right. way, that's a great point. I think Jefferson actually is doing the same thing in his first inaugural address. I mean, he's, he says on the one hand, we're all federals, we're all Republicans, which is a nice way of appealing to the common principles that Americans ought to share. But, 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 he, but he is also implying, I think, that in his own sort of, again, in a Kennedy-like way, that, the, that, you know, look, the Jeffersonian Republicans won the election. Um, and they therefore had the had the better view of, of things, and, I, and part of the reason that the Federalists, uh, you know, really meet their demise in this election is that they cannot articulate the response to the claims from Jefferson and others that the Republican Party, the Jeffersonian Republicans, truly and best represent the fundamental principles of American republicanism. And the Federalist Party is dead after that election precisely because they cannot articulate articulate a response to the kinds of arguments Jefferson and, and Madison and others are making. I'm a little, I'm not, I'm not being too clear on this, I apologize, but, but, but just a, one other thing that Peter said that made me think about this question of compromise. It seems to me that the election of 1800 especially re reveals to us a, 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 a kind of broader Republican kind of compromise that works itself out even in the most extremely contested and hotly debated elections. I mean, again, 1800 is an extremely volatile election because, as Jefferson characterizes again, this election was about what Americans hold most dear, what principles they want their, you know, their, their, their political society to be based on. And so, in some ways, it was the most, the potentially most, uh, uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, divisive, yeah, divisive kind of election that we could have. And yet, we had the election, the people spoke, and the majority wins. Now, again, Jefferson reminds us, though the majority wins, they don't, they, they, there are limits to what the majority can do. They cannot rightfully violate the rest of the minority. But, but in a sense, this kind of democratic election represents Republican compromise, because, because the, in the aftermath of this, this election, as Jefferson is urging Americans, uh, uh, to see here in his inaugural address is, is that part of Republican compromise means you have an election, the majority wins, and the minority accepts, at least temporarily, the victory of the majority, so long as the rights of the minority are not being violated. That's Republican compromise in another form. Never mind compromise among elected officials, that's a different problem. But among the people, we have built into our republic a kind of compromise. You know, so, uh, I may, you know, I didn't have not agree with the outcomes of several elections lately, but, uh, but I don't, I don't say, you know, that's it, I'm out. I don't say, you know, I'm out of here. I don't say I'm, you know, uh, I, I'm moving to Canada or I'm seceding from the union or something like that, right? I compromise. I, 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 I concede to the to the rightful will of the majority in an election, and at the same time. I say to myself, there's another election coming up in two years or four years. 
and there's always hope that, that things can turn the other way. And that's just part of the compromise. And then, and, you know, if, if, if things go the way I want them to go in the next election, I expect the minority to accede to, to you know, to the decision of the minority or the majority in that election. That's absolutely true, but I would just, this takes one word in your articulation, and that, it's not just hope. In other words, that you're going to become a majority next time, next election, or the many election cycles in the formation of, as we know, different majorities, but that you work towards that. Absolutely. You're duty bound to work towards that, and that means that you get into the public sphere and make arguments with regard to that, not just simply uh, uh, decrying your opponents as being thieves and knaves and and fools and so forth, but actually making arguments why they're wrong on this, that, or the other thing. Right. Uh, and, right. and, and, and then they'll do the same thing in return once you win in the next many election cycle. And so forth. Uh, okay. that, 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 uh, that, that is a, that's, that sort of, con that politics of consent in itself, rightly understood, envisages a certain form of justice and self-government, what we call self-government, uh, and constitutional government, therefore, uh, uh, you know, made, made into an intellectual and moral habit among the people. And you can't give that up by, by simply saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, if, if things don't go my way, and if these SOBs, you know, elect this guy or the other party again, you know, I'm going to go and, and, and uh, you know, ten sheep in New Zealand or something like that. That you can't do. You have no right. No, no, I'm serious. That is That's a moral right. obligation. You cannot act that way. You have to fight intellectually. You have to fight, and and that's why that's when that's why I mean, this is when America become loud. Whether it's in it's in you know in in in, in 1796 or 1800 or today, they're yeah. loud, and boisterous people, and they should be. Yeah. So yeah, per that's perfect. So all I was, what I was suggesting is that this larger, because I'm describing it, this larger kind of Republican compromise among the people. What it means is uh, a compromise in that larger Republican, lowercase r Republican sense means that I I I, I recognize the rightful, uh, if you will, decision of the majority, and yet I don't simply have to concede or uh, agree to it. I can still argue against it. In other words, Absolutely. there's still room for partisanship with that kind of topic. Absolutely. Yeah. And besides, New Zealand won't take it. <laughs> Why? Do they have Do they have laws like the Swiss against dirty people or something? Is that what? <laughs> 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 but but you see, look. Can I just say? Can I add to that? It reminds me of what Lincoln says about getting rid of slavery, which is, of course, it's the just thing to do, but you can't do it without people's consent. That's right. Yes. Yes. So that you can't force justice. By the very act of forcing justice, you're violating one of the principles of justice, which is consent. So you might say, look, the people have chosen wrongly and unjustly, but you don't say, well, therefore, I'm, I'm going to take some act of force, you know, opposing them by force or an act of force leaving the country, going to New Zealand and, and That's right. hurting sheep, right? That's an act of force in a way, too. Uh, you say, no, we have to persuade them because consent is part of justice as we understand that in America. And you have to have both of those. No, no, it's absolutely true. And if I may butt in, I mean, that is, that is directly related to this question of education in the Republic. In other words, education in the Republic is not simply a catechism. And it's, you know what I mean? It really is. It, it, you really have to get, uh, whether they're young people or older people, it doesn't make any difference as long as they're human beings and potential adults. In this creation of adults, as you put it, you have to make them see that they themselves have to consent to these things. They cannot be made to consent. You can, it's not just simply clicking your heels and saluting that here are American principles and here's how, how it works. Here's how a bill becomes a law and therefore, you know, you're now a citizen. That's not the way it works. That's too simple. Right. Yeah. I don't say, therefore, that if what you're saying is true, um, you you can't do this kind of education by textbook. Right? Absolutely, and you can't do it by right. force. I mean, you really you can't you can't force a person to be free and virtuous. He has to he has to choose that. Uh, yes. That's a that's and is that a tough thing to do? Are you kidding me? Uh, witness us. You know, it's a very difficult thing to do. Witness the rest of the world. It's virtually impossible. Yeah. So the sacredness of the cause, as it were, 
becomes manifest, you know, because if if you guys, you Americans, you gringos, blow this, you know, it's over. I mean, for another thousand years, uh, you know, it's true you can give enough monkeys a typewriter and eventually bang out Hamlet. In theory, that's true, but you know, yeah. you shouldn't. But, but, but by the way, this is why we use. I'm sorry, Peter, I'm going to cut you off. This is the we use these documents. I'm just attacking Americans now. I'm just. This is too much. But, but, stop me! Stop me! <laughs> this is precisely why we use these documents because what the documents show is that our own history in a certain way reveals um, that that uh, that having a free republic means we have to work out for ourselves. That's right. Without being told from the top down. Look, the history, history of Russia, the history of Russia and all other countries, let me be blunt, is force. It's a study of force. It's fascinating, you know. It is very interesting. The Louis XIV and the Peter the Greats and Genghis Khan and so forth and so on. Study of how one character or faction, if you like, uh, overthrew another. This is true whether it's divine right monarchy or not. It doesn't make any sense. The study of America is public reasons, consent, within the context of these principles of natural right, natural right. There's a huge difference between our history and what it means and all other histories, which are simply the histories of accident and force. Yes, yeah, that's right. And look, I mean, I, I think I, we may have brought this up in a previous seminar, but, uh, but you know, look, James Madison, to me, is the, he embodies republicanism, even down to the idea of compromise. When, uh, you know, for example, in, in what I consider to be one of the greatest acts of statesmanship, James Madison, who helped to write the Constitution, and, and in fact, probably had more influence on the Constitution than any other person, right? I mean, he wrote the Virginia Plan and introduced it. Uh, you know, he's called the father of the Constitution. He stands up. He's, you know, first of all, you know, he's elected to the lowly House of Representatives in the first government, right, after the Constitution's ratified. And he stands up in the House of Representatives and says, we need to change this Constitution, which he wrote, which in, in his mind he thought was probably perfect. <laughs> I mean, Madison never conceded that anything needed to be changed in the Constitution. Why did he want, why did he introduce amendments to the Constitution? Because a respectable number of citizens are expected, right? That's what he said in his speech to Congress. A respectable that's number of respectable citizens expect these changes. Madison always understood the need to leave open to the people, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to decide for themselves to work out. Or as he puts it in Federalist Number 37, to liquidate the meaning of things, to, to sort of Work out for themselves what things mean. What do our principles mean? How do we apply them? What does the Constitution mean? That's Republican government for Matt. And so, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the questions I have here in front of me from another participant is a quote from uh, from Jackson, I believe. Uh, this person thinks uh, you know, quotes Jackson's argument that the perfection of our government rests in its in, in the very nature of its imperfections. Uh, I think this, I think Jackson said that. This person is attributing that statement to Jackson. Jackson said the perfection of our government it, it, it rests on the very nature of its imperfection. And I, I think what that kind of means in a Madisonian way is because yeah, I mean, look, in the end, having a free republic means that the people get to work out for themselves, not not elected officials simply, and not experts, and not government in general. It's the people that over time get to work out for themselves what these things mean in light of, of the basic principles that they, that they um, that, that, you know, that they come to agree with. Um, What's that right. letter from Jefferson to Major Don Cartwright where he says, all things are changeable save the natural rights of man? That's it. That's perfect. Yeah. And, and it reminds me of the end of Jefferson's uh, bill for religious freedom in Virginia, right? Though we cannot tell future legislatures what they can and can't do, we can say that if they change, uh, you know, the laws of Virginia to establish religion that violate religious freedom, it will be a violation of natural law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are some limits to election change, but within those broad parameters, and, and I'll go back to what Peter started with earlier. You know, in America, we don't have the same parameters for debate and discussion that they had in, in Great Britain. So we do have parameters. They just we've just replaced a, a set of sort of traditional understandings of things rooted in custom with uh, with parameters that are rooted in natural right and, and, and conceptions of the laws of nature. Parameters parameters as it were uh, that are defined by 
for the the glory of human nature is what it is. So you know, so natural rights are inalienable. Not only cannot they cannot by right be taken from you, but you cannot give them up by right. Those are the parameters that that limit your conversations. And as long as everybody agrees on those parameters, you'll be doing all right. But then you but then you do get divisive elections. Yeah, I mean, Chris was talking about the device, how divisive 1800 was, but it wasn't divisive probably in that respect, right? But then you get elections like 1860, which is really a divisive election because you have a That's fundamental exactly. disagreement about it. But the interesting thing about that, I would absolutely prove, uh, 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 but, but that election really began in 54, you see. In other words, the election of 1860, to speak in modern terms, was really the epic phenomenon of the conversation that began in 1854 as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which overthrew the Missouri Compromise, which now, now then made slavery into a, a matter of consent. And Lincoln said, you can't do that. You can't vote whether we ought to have slavery or not, because you can't vote on the wrong. You see what I mean? So that's the limit of consent. And that's and why he went back into politics. That's why he was aroused because that principle was at stake. That slavery is wrong. Right. You know, but but even that to exist, that's a different story. Right. But but even that, uh, 1854, is preceded by a big change in the way people, especially the, the, the slave interest, thinks about slavery. Right. In that's abandoning right. things like natural rights. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because. You know, not being angels in honor, they they started attaching their ever more pressing interest uh, with slavery, and they started justifying it as a right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I'm sorry. And Lincoln, Lincoln is in that Lincoln is giving us an example of a statesman who is arguing against what people hold to be in their own interests. That's right. right. White Americans hold to be in their own interests. Another question I have in front of me is along the same line. Well, not only that, but Chris, can I just footnote that by saying? That's absolutely true. And furthermore, Lincoln goes so far in his wonderful poetic ratiocination that he says, he says, by the way, if we were in their shoes, we oh, would act okay. as they act. You yeah. see what I mean? In other words, how is that for understanding human nature in a particular context? That's yeah. brilliant. That's a great point. No, that's wonderful. Um, but on a, on a related note, I have a question from a participant uh, earlier. Dr. Shram spoke about founders arguing against the interests of the people. And this person is wondering if there are examples of the founders doing something similar to what you were just talking about Lincoln doing. Um, and, I, and, and my first thought on this, actually, I think Jeff brought this up. It had to do, for example, with the question of religious liberty and, and uh, religious establishments. I mean, there were people at the time arguing that uh, my religion, for example, is the true religion. You know, I'm Anglican. The Anglican religion is the true, true religion. Therefore, why not simply establish the Anglican religion as the official church of the union or something, you know, something along those lines, right? And, and founders, uh, the founders made arguments against those kinds of arguments by pointing out that though you think it is in your interest as an Anglican or a, a Baptist or whatever it might be, right, to have an established a certain kind of religion, your religion establishes the official religion. It actually is not in your interest. Yeah. So they would make arguments for principle on the need for religious liberty. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, you know, I mean, arguments on primogeniture and entail could be said to be in that category, for example. Great, great. Yeah. It might be in your interest or your family think you to do it the following way, but it is against natural rights because they're limiting, you're putting an unnatural limitation on, 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 on human uh, striving and happiness. I mean, one of the best examples of all that, we don't tend to talk about him enough, and the older I get, the more I like him. Uh, for both good reasons, philosophic and prejudicial, is Franklin. You know, Franklin was, you know, very conscious of these things in very particular ways. And one of the things that always that I did like about Franklin, once I started reading him, instead of listening to Marxist interpreters of him as representation of sort of bourgeois virtues and crap like that, is that this is a guy that looks, you know, he lives in Philadelphia, which, which is, relatively speaking, was a city, of course. I mean, he's a he's a he's he's a he's a merchant. Uh, he's a, he's involved in business. He makes money. He becomes very wealthy by his early 40s, and it's done on the basis of printing, by the way. You know, um, and 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 he encourages others to do the same. And not only that, he makes the argument that all others can do the same. He, they can that you can you labor 
uh, for for others for a while, and then you you shift into laboring for yourself, and even others laboring for you. Uh, you know the, the the sort of the more explicit Lincolnian or Whig argument with regard to these things. And it's not just a question of the aristocracy or the habits of, you know, self-sufficient farmers and so forth that's going to build this republic. Uh, it's an understanding that, 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 that you create wealth and that you have a right to that creation uh, by virtue of your labor. And then, of course, the capital that you make with that, you know, does these amazing things that we try to do from, from, you know, establishing voluntary fire departments to, uh, University of Pennsylvania, never mind, you know, inventing the stove and lightning and blah, blah, blah. Fascinating guy, uh, and who, who I think is, uh, you know, might be the smartest guy in the room. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I can just think of a couple particular examples of founders who sort of, on the basis of right, acted against interest. Uh, uh, John Marshall, you know, who wrote Marbury versus Madison on the left, um, said that it might be in the interest, he's talking about the Alien and Sedition Act, and he said it might be in the interest of the Federalists to shut up their critics, Yeah. but it's it's stupid and we shouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, you look, the most obvious example of this is George Washington freeing slaves in his will. Uh, all kinds of manumissions occurred among people for whom it was nothing but against their interest to do that. But they did it on grounds of rights. Obviously, some didn't. Um, and we can talk about the, you know, the disjunction between their understanding of justice and, and them acting in their interests, or as they understood it. But people like Washington, freeing his slaves, is going to act against interest uh, on, on grounds, he said, of, of natural rights. Yeah, right. That is an ineradicable, massive fact uh, in our politics. I mean, that point, that point there. I mean, that's just a wonderful thing. And when you you can, you know, you can criticize the founders for all kinds of things. And George Washington, you know, austere sort of European type gentleman, and I really wouldn't want to have a cup of coffee with. But what a smart, wise, virtuous son of a bitch that guy was. Yeah. That's his heart. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Three points. Uh, we are uh, closing in on the end of our time here, so I, I, I just want to ask one last question. It's related to um, to some things we talked about earlier. Uh, this participant writes, my students had a difficult time respecting the office of president because their person didn't win, quote, unquote. Uh, and I tried very hard to get them to respect the office and the purpose of voting. Uh, how can I go about doing it? How do you persuade people to right. respect the office of the president? Despite you know the what? With, with the, you know how I, I tell my students, when you, uh, you know, when my son, he's eight years old, He'll sometimes just say Obama, and I'll always say, "Well, you mean President Obama?" Right. Um, because when you when you say when you say Mr. President, you and you stand up for the president when he comes in the room, and you show a certain level of decorum um, for him, you are respecting the Constitution, and that's that's the that's the people's act of governing themselves. You're respecting yourself as a self-governing free human being when you respect the president who holds that constitutional law. And even if you do not, I agree, beautifully put, even of course, perhaps especially, if you do not agree with him. That's absolutely uh, true. Yeah, and, and that, that explanation is in effect a, to your student, to one student, uh, it doesn't matter if he's 16 or 19, uh, is, is the same argument we've been making in this conversation, I think, having to do with what self-government is and constitutional government is and, and freedom of the human mind and your ability in a good way, not in some vehement, stupid way, to make sure that your guy wins the next election, <laughs> not just for the presidency, because that's not the most important thing. Remember, elections are every two years, not every four years. Uh, that that you you elect your guys for Congress and so forth and so on. That goes without saying. Uh, does that make any sense? I mean, is, is that it's a great question, of course. It's a great question and two great answers, two very clear answers. It reminds me of uh, of uh, one of my favorite uh, of the miniseries, The Band of Brothers. I know you've all seen it. Uh, there's a yeah. there's a really rotten, um, really bad officer, Major Sobel, uh, who was in charge of. Uh, 
training easy company before they went to Europe. And, and they, they just despised the guy because he was really a bad officer. And, uh, and they, ran, they ran into him later, and one of the guys that he had been training in the easy company was now a captain or something like that. Their, their former major captain, I forget which it was, he refused to salute. The, the bad one refused to salute this, uh, this, this officer that he had been in charge of training he re because they had rebelled against him and reported him as a bad officer and all this. And the, and the other guy said to him, we don't salute the man, we salute the office. And that reminds me of, of what we're doing, what we do here with the president. By respecting the president, even if it's not our guy, so to speak, right, our person, is just as we're respecting the Constitution, and we are therefore also respecting, again, the reason of the people who are, which is embodied in that Constitution. As imperfect as it may be, this mode by which we elect people, and including the president, it is a reflection of the of the reason of the people, um, and I think again by res by respecting the president, respecting the office of the president, respecting the constitution, it, it also embodies a kind of respect for the people themselves, for ourselves, in a certain way, and our and, and, and Let me let me look, absolutely true, but one more footnote to that, Please. if I may say, I don't want to sound you know sort of uh, seeing seeing things through rose-colored glasses, but yeah, as you know, I'm not an Obama guy. Uh, but, you know, calling him Mr. President is critical. You know, I've always done that from the beginning, and I could tell that the majority of my students didn't like that. I didn't explain it. I just did it. So a certain kind of respect and dignity for the office and so forth. And furthermore, under certain occasions, depending on the situation, I can't think of any particular moment, to be honest with you, but there are. When I, I wanted to make sure that we understood him as he understood himself as much as possible, not simply criticize him because we were his political uh, opposites or opponents, but give him some benefit of the doubt. In certain cases, when he made a very good speech and or a, a, a reasonable decision, you know, you, you praise him for that and you explain that to your students. I think that's a reasonable thing to do and vice versa, by the way, when our, my guy, I mean, you know, in the days when, you know, Richard Nixon, I mean, I was not exactly at home, you know, when, with Richard Nixon and I treated him accordingly. Right. Yeah, great points. Yeah, and you can get, you know, the, back to the, to the teacher's question. One of the things you can do, of course, is, you know, to respect the office, the constitutional office, um, is to is to get as deep as deep an understanding as possible of the Constitution itself and how impressive it is. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing, one more, again, a footnote, I, my mind is picked a little bit on this. I mean, I have often jumped very quickly into saying the President of the United States does not represent the American people, you see. This is just an office. He's not the government. The President of the United States is not the government. Yeah, it's just, not a parliamentary system, right? It's not a parliamentary system, so he says, my administration, and you know, and so forth. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain says, the government will do this, <laughs> you see. That the President can't do that, the, the power of the... Uh, is divided, and and then you get into the constitutional mode. But it's just one part of the government. It's one third, sure. at best. Yeah, and one third of one half. One third of one half. That's right. I mean, and then so the, speaker, the speaker of the house, who under a different occasion, it's not so much under Boehner, often spoke as if he were the government, as if he represented the people, because he won the latest election. You see what I mean? That's also false. That's right. Great, great points. Wonderful point. Well, uh, we have come to the end of our time together. Um, as always, gentlemen, I've appreciated your thoughts. and uh, Thank you very much for sharing things uh, with, with me. I've learned a great deal, as always. Uh, it's been really enlightening, and, and I thank you very much for your time this morning. Any last thoughts on anything? Uh, Accusations? Uh, insults? Thank you for the opportunity. It's always fun to, to sit around with other knaves and fools and <laughs> to be intelligent. I like it. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Peter. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks very much for both of your time. Um, thanks again uh, to our participants as well today. Uh, really great questions. Uh, useful questions. Um, yeah, can I just say, by the way, just uh, uh, sorry. I mean, you know, it's snowing outside, and you know, it's Christmas time, and so forth. Can I just wish everybody a merry Christmas? Very, very good. Same to you, and same to everybody. Uh, merry Christmas as well. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just a reminder, participants, uh, you will be asked to fill out a survey form. Please complete that form and include your address and send your letter documenting your participation today. 
Um, if you've enjoyed today's webinar, think about taking a course through the Ashbrook Center, one of our graduate courses offered as part of our MAG program, Master of Arts in American History and Government, or our Master of Arts uh, with a specialization in teaching American history and government. You can find out more information on both programs on our website at teachingamericanhistory.org. Our next webinar will be again with Peter Schramm. Happy to have you back. This one will be on January 25th. Uh, Dan Monroe of Milliken University will be joining us. Dan's a really thoughtful, thoughtful scholar. Uh, and the topic will be sectional divide in antebellum America. So that'll be fun as well. well let right. me just say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me just say with Dan Monroe, I mean, this is an amusing man. He has a great sense of humor, unlike the current participants' uh, <laughs> seminar. So that ought to be a great seminar. I'm not going to let go of him. He's a great guy, <laughs> funny as anything. He's good. He'll be good. This was good, too. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks. Be careful going home. Thanks, everybody.